And welcome, welcome. I'm so glad to be here with you, Jacqueline. And I don't think I said that quite right. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> I have a few different friends with the name Andrea and Andrea, and then I always get in my head about Andrea, Andrea. Anyway, um, I am Nadia Colburn. Do you want to introduce yourself? I'm Jacqueline Suskin. I'm very unattached to the way people say my name. <laughs> <laughs> and we're happy to be here with you all. So what we're going to do is... Um, I'll do a little introduction and then I'll be reading from my own poems around uh, around really the earth, poems that, that, that center on that in some way, and then offering a little prompt for you, a little writing prompt, a little meditation writing prompt for you all. And then Jacqueline will do the same. We'll read from her beautiful new book and offer a prompt. And then we will have um, time at the end for questions and answers. So please do stay till the end discussion. And then there's also, you know, you can engage throughout with the chat as well. So I want to welcome everyone very warmly. And um, I have my little traveling singing bowl with me. So maybe what I'll do is just invite the bowl as a more official beginning reminder to come back to your body to your breath <sighs> take a nice long deep breath and enjoy this time this time is for you this is really right what do we have if not time so this is our sacred time together So welcome again. I am Nadia Colburn and I am at the moment here in Colorado Springs. I'm normally in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I live. I am the founder of the Align Your Story Writing School um, and also the author of two poetry books. Most recently, I Say the Sky. And um, I often bring together meditation, yoga, writing, integrated practices, and also bring together our writing practices with our social and environmental engagement. So how can we really have a holistic vision for the way we use our voice? Um, and I'm really, really delighted to be here with Jacqueline. Um, and she, Jacqueline is a poet and educator who has been te teaching workshops, writing books and hosting retreats and creating spontaneous poetry around the world since 2009. She's the author of eight books, and most recently, um, this beautiful book, A Year in Practice. Her project, Poem Store, um, has allowed her to compose over 40,000 impro improvisational poems for patrons who choose a topic in exchange for a unique verse. And her work has been widely featured in such places as the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Atlantic. Um, Jacqueline will tell you more about what she does, but I'm really honored to be here with you today um, and excited to be part of this conversation with you and also with everyone who's here with us. So again, thank you all. I will maybe begin by reading and just talking a little bit about some of my poems and inviting you to again, take a nice deep breath and allow yourself to receive these poems and to interact with them in whatever way feels right for you. I think that as I was writing this book, I Say the Sky, I was asking a lot of questions personally, um, and the poems were places to turn over those questions, to take things that felt kind of formless and bring them into form. And the first poem in the book, um, is 
really grappling with, you know, the big questions that I asked throughout. So, and it seems appropriate to just mention here, if we're talking about poetry and the earth, how can there be so much beauty and wonder um, at the same time that there is so much destruction and suffering? And how can we, how can I be big enough to hold it all? And the poem becomes kind of a space to turn things over and to try to be a container. So again, I invite you to listen. And I was at a reading recently where um, a poet just invited people, as you're hearing lines, things that resonate with you, feel free to jot them down, but also feel free just to allow, allow the poems to sink into you as if your body were the earth and the language, the rain or the sun. So the first line goes into the um, poem. I think it is such a beautiful dawn, and my mind, which wants to hold things as they are, cannot hold this morning, first of April, spring too early this year by three weeks, the daffodils of my city spurred forward by the warmth. Cannot hold Brett, gone, Patrizia, gone, not the marching clouds, not the sky that is perched unaltering above the clouds, not the methane leaks, not the whales suffering the piercing sounds of boats. I reach out my hands, one and then the other, spread my fingers as light falls through them. The next poem is called March even though I have to read it now before we're too, too far away from March, <laughs> now that we're in mid-April. March. All winter we walked on the fallen sky, walked on clouds until we fell thigh deep to earth. Now the clouds are running down the side of the mountain in small hidden rivers. What in you needs melting? What do you do with your anger and your hope? All night down the side of the mountain, waters run together where we cannot see. Underneath, the earth is awakening. Once more, the tips of bare branches put out new buds. Again, they clasp their small palms together in prayer. So this next poem is also about change. Sorry, there's someone at my door. I'm not sure what's happening. I'll be right back. I think some um, someone evangelizing. I'm, I'm not going to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> this is a different form of not evangelizing. <laughs> okay. You said prayer and they arrived. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. We've got the answer. <laughs> um, this, the, this is the creative interruption. Yes, yes, exactly. I love that. <laughs> oh my gosh, now he's knocking. I'm busy. I'm not coming to the door. <laughs> this could, there's a poem here. <laughs> okay, up flying. Whole flocks of geese in my childhood hunking their way north. The streets dirty with pigeons. The sky blackened by starlings, each small pointed wing so close to another's it was just a blur. Now three billion birds are missing. We wake to so many forms of emptiness. So much loss greets us in our sleep. In my childhood, I thought the world I'd entered would be the one I'd exit. In the poplar, one grackle whistles, not to me. I think in that poem, I was both thinking about the external world, but also the internal world because of, oh my gosh, he's very persistent. This is um, the visitor from Porlock who's not letting the dream get away. <laughs> I'm gonna go tell him to go away. I'll be right back. Hi, I'm, I'm not interested. Okay. 
Wow. So you all know um, in Coleridge's famous poem, Kubla Khan, he was having a dream and he woke up from the dream and he had this whole long poem in his head and he went to write it down. And as he was in the middle of writing it down, there was a knock on his door, supposedly the visitor from Porlock, right? And he went to get the door and then he came back and he had couldn't remember the rest of his dream, so we just have the poem as it is. I'm not sure I believe that story because the poem seems so complete in its form, but maybe dreams are funny in that way. So anyway, this is <laughs> okay. Um, so in this poem, Up Flying, the um, What, what's, what's lost, what changes is both in the personal life and in the life around us. And I think as poets, we're exploring, right? What's the relationship between my inner world and the external world? And it's like, we are, we are in some ways the canary in the, in the gold mine, right? We're, we're, we're perceptive about what's around us. We're paying attention. Our bodies are paying attention. Our souls are paying attention. Our minds are paying attention. And then the poem becomes a place to hold what we're, what we're perceiving. And I think, you know, from across time, that relationship between the natural world and then the poet's inner life gets reflected in a poem because we're aware of those relationships because poetry is relational. And as the world, the external environment is changing, poets are aware of it. It's our calling, it seems to me, to feel it in our body and to respond to that in our poetry. And so in this poem, I'm also specifically kind of referring to Keats's Nightingale, where he hears the Nightingale and he's in dialogue with the Nightingale. Is, is the Nightingale talking to him, right? There are all these birds and Birds are the symbol of poetry across ages, right? And yet, how are we responding to them? How, how is our poetry changing as we're aware of the natural world changing? Um, and yet, it's also the natural world, right? We still have the seasons. We are inseparable from the natural world. There's no humanity without water, without air, without cells, without plants, right? I know I'm saying what you all know, but how does this affect us as poets? How do we bring this into our poems? And I think that as poets, that's something that we are particularly um, kind of conditioned to write about and, and, to, and to be aware of, of, of how the inner and the outer inter R. So let me read a few more. And I also invite you just to take a moment and maybe just take another breath here. And I think that coming back to the breath, the breath is itself right, something external that we bring into our body, that we're aware of that interchange always between self and non-self. Again, one of my teachers is Thich Nhat Hanh, and he talks so much about interbeing. Um, so, so we just let's take a breath again. And also, um, if my poems are in dialogue with, you know, I, I mentioned Keats. I think poems are always in dialogue with the world around us, but also with other poetry. So I hope that, you know, in having this discussion and being in dialogue, you know, the two of us, but also all of us on this call, and then inspiring you to write your poems and think about how does the natural world relate to our own creative rhythms. Um, there's this very large kind of exchange between different creative um, processes and productions that we're all a part of that I just want to kind of bring to the foreground here and what we're doing. 
I see that Susan in the chat said, I'd never heard that birds are the symbol of poetry. And I also wrote that down. Birds are the symbol of poetry across the ages. And I was like, oh, are they? Tell us more. I want to know more about that too. <laughs> um, yeah, I think you see birds um, across cultures even. I was actually recently reading this book, 1491, um, which I highly recommend about the Americas before contact with Europeans. And it was talking about birds as symbols of poetry in um, one of the, I can't, I'm not going to get it. I'm not, I can't remember now if it was in Mexico or Peru, but in one of those um, South American or, or maybe one of the American cultures, and I know I can't remember which one, but talking about birds as symbols of poetry, you see birds in Roman poems, in Greek poems, Sappho talks about birds, we have birds in romantic poetry, but really throughout, um, not just European poetry, but across cultures, so that could be an interesting conversation. That oh yeah, poets do more. love birds, that's for sure. <laughs> and it makes sense, right, because I don't know when I when I teach poetry, I think people often feel like poetry is very rarefied and you need to have a lot of special training to understand and write poetry. And in fact, poetry is really maybe the oldest art form along with song, right? It's like we use our voices, our natural body to create this art form with rhythm. It uses you know, it's related to dance, it's related to meaning making, and, um, and just as birds sing without any kind of special training. So I think people also yeah. sing and write poems, mm -hmm. right? It's kind of in us. And we've been acculturized to think that it's this rarefied thing and that only some people do. Um, but I think really if we listen to ourselves all of us want to sing on some level so i love what you're saying here christian says you're a songwriter singing a lot about birds are big communicators um birds instinctively connect the earth and the sky yes and susan i love that you're susan wing also that you're the wings are there in your name um hope is the thing with feathers emily dickinson Birds also communicate with those who've passed. Beautiful. I wonder if I have other bird poems. Um, I definitely have so many. <laughs> <laughs> I do feel like that I and I have a friend who wrote a whole book about women connected to birds. And there's that Terry Tempest Williams book mm -hmm. when women were birds. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I feel like it comes up a lot. And I just yeah. I do really love the idea that they sing without any special training. <laughs> That's really potent. I have a slightly less happy bird song, speaking of birds and women, and this is again in dialogue with Keats. So um, the nightingale is Philomela in the Greek myth, and the myth says that she, um, someone now I'm going to, if I get it wrong, but I believe that she was raped by her brother-in-law, and then she wanted to express what had happened to her and he cut out her tongue huh? so that she couldn't say what had happened to her hmm. and she turned into then the nightingale and so she the nightingale that keats is writing to is this raped woman who wanted to share what had happened to her but then was transformed into this bird so there's this trauma and and in the middle section of my book is is really exploring especially you know my own and women's silences what have we not been able to say what have we needed to say in other ways so this poem is called summer evening and it's also in dialogue with keats's poem to the nightingale and keats himself was experiencing and writing out of really extreme loss and trauma when he was writing his poem to the nightingale, he had witnessed um, both of his parents die, his mother die of TB in his arms. He was a doctor. He knew um, he knew what was happening. He knew he would probably get it. And 
he um, then did and, and died at 23, 24. So when he says, I've been half in love with easeful death, he is not, um, he, it's, it's, he's not being hyperbolic. He, he's been around a lot, of, a lot of death of his very closest family members and, and thinking about his own. Summer evening. The nightingale flies outside in the dusk, singing and singing. Philomela, with such sweetness, her tongue, so that she stays silent, cut out of her mouth. And still she sings. Too happy in thine happiness, Keats wrote to her among the Englantine, himself half in love with easeful death. No, let me put the tongue back in the throat. Let me listen to myself. Ooh. Here's some more birds. Teach me how to pray anywhere. Teach me that you live not only in the open field, the cardinal singing at first dawn, but also in the concrete parking lot of the Everett Mall, in the flashing lights of Old Navy and the wires crossing the open expanse above me. The cars, the cars speed down the highway, their tires spin, spin. There is so much work to do. Dark oil flows over the whole land. Teach me how to praise your whole body. So I was imagining reading some different poems, but I'm going to stay with the bird theme, because I think, and I'll do a bird prompt. So I'm going to read two more really short poems and give you a prompt. My throat is a fire, is a line of birds waiting to rise up from still water. Is the earth dark and heavy with spring rain? Is the air, as the mist lifts, sighing, ready to let go? And maybe what I'll do is lead you in a really short meditation and then read a poem and give a prompt from the poem. Um, and again, it's slightly different what I imagined, but I love that there is this conversation that came from the birds. Okay, I invite you to come back to your body. I, imagine, I invite you actually to imagine that you feel in your body a bird's body. See what that feels like. Imagine having wings. Imagine sitting up in a tree and singing. Imagine looking up to the blue sky. Allow yourself to fly around a little if you want. Maybe you decide what kind of bird you want to be. Maybe you have a question in your heart or in your body or in your relationships and you want to give the question over to the bird. What does the bird recommend doing? Does it fly up? Does it sweep down? And again, is it a big bird? Is it a small bird? What color is it? And I invite you now to go into your own writing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this a little bit differently because I want you to stay with whatever bird you chose and set a scene for your bird and enter into a dialogue with your bird. 
What do you want to say to this bird that's maybe a you? And what does the bird want to say back? What's happening here? Where are you? What do you see? What do you hear? What do you smell around you? And stay connected to this bird body as you write. If you want to bring in another element just to make it a little bit playful, I've put six words in the chat, heavy, throat, weight, lies, go, and water. And see if there are any of those or all of those words want to be incorporated in what you're writing. So I hope this is something that you'll want to come back to. Um, and I want to make sure we have time for Jacqueline's poems and prompts. I always think that in spaces like this, usually what I receive and put in my journal are these like little bits that I then revisit later. So like certain ideas that spark something or an image or something like that, that I then return to and will flesh out when I have more time. So don't feel rushed. But I also love to tell people if you're writing and you just feel like writing, maybe that's what you're meant to do. Um, so I will read some poems and these, I'm going to mostly read these poems that are from a book of mine that isn't published yet. Um, and then I have some prompts and ideas from my book that Nadia held up this book, A Year in Practice, which is all about kind of moving through the cyclical nature of the seasons and how that affects you as a as a writer, as a creator, but also just as a person in the world. Um, I, this book just came out in December and it's been so funny to live this entire year so far following it and reflecting on, you know, reading my own words and seeing that yes, indeed, that is what the seasons are offering and winter and the shift from winter into spring is, I think, one of the hardest times of the year. So um, hopefully some of these poems will give some breath to that and maybe a couple ideas of 
some things that you can kind of add to your practice as you make that shift. Because no matter where you are in the world, there's a shift happening. <laughs> it might be different depending on where you live, but um, I'm going to go with spring as our collective feeling right now. <clears throat> uh, this poem's called Hello Spring. I'll be ripped into the story of earth now because the season is changing and I can no longer sleep through it all. I now have no winter excuse to tuck myself in for too many hours because the grass, the green, the flowers, the severe messages of bugs and birds quiver against each bud about to pop. Kneeling in the mud, I'm urged to yell like color, but the courage of silence wraps around me. I listen, dig and clip, soothe myself like a dog and climb only one limb of the apple tree because there's no need to break the crown with my weight. I'm waiting, like all living things, to go back under, to rediscover the darkness, to say goodbye again to sun. Um, I kind of like the idea of thinking that each poem can be a prompt and that you can read something or hear someone read something and there's like a prompt in that for yourself. And so I just like that idea of like what it feels like in your body to say goodbye again to the sun. Like, is there fear around that? Is, is that discouraging to you? Do you, how, what's your response to that? Cause for me, I know that actually as a writer, I kind of thrive in the winter time if I'm allowed to just be a writer. <laughs> but uh, uh, this year I experienced having to teach all winter and travel and I didn't get to rest. And so now I'm really looking forward to the sun in a, in a way that I never have before. Um, so maybe you can ask yourself that question, you know, what, is it, what does it feel like to you to, to shift from one season to the next? Is there something that you look forward to when the darkness returns or is it just something you're just dreading the whole year? <laughs> um, this poem is called Beauty Over and Over. We make art to convince each other that life is worth living. Remember why? Because cold plum, because other person, because questions, light through windows, bird bones so small, babies growing inside, seeds that do so much because of sun. We say here is beauty over and over, up against the rotting log, up against the numbered days. Look at the sky, cloud, woven rug and well-made boot. Even in the shadow, even in the cold, the rose continues blooming. I cry and look ugly, but it's pretty too. Death brings blood, but oh wow, the red, the flowing, the temperature. The wind moves metal, the unseen air causes dancing, and even in the worst of pain, a dead flower, all moldy, is brilliant with some proof of happening, some hue of having lived. Um, that one kind of brings up this idea of a prompt that's like, you know, according to those first lines, we make art to convince each other that life is worth living, remember why, and that maybe then you would offer up your list of reasons um, that you would give to yourself or to someone else. I always say that poems can bring this great comfort and that something you would say to soothe yourself is generally something that you could say to soothe someone else and vice versa. So. There's some sense I like to build into my poems of this balance between like honesty and the things that come without the possibility to soothe. And then this idea that there is also this inherent ability that we have to comfort each other and, and words do that in many ways. So, um, okay, this, this one's called Small Fires. Also, I love that there were birds in both of those poems. <laughs> I didn't plan that. <laughs> Maybe there's a bird in this one too, who knows? <laughs> um, small fires. I too have been the bad shadow. A list of past offense comes pooling into clarity with first light. 
the slap of a bitter herb finds its way in, into my mouth. And I know I need to sit in the dirt, watch a fire burn, touch a thistle. The bats perform blackness in front of my window. I can see each wing cut out by the razor of God. The hillside trail is hardly there, but my feet know the way. Only madrone branches burn at the foot of the elder madrone. And this is where I switch my head out for the rock again. I switch it back when I start singing. Who watches over me while I shed my nastiness? Who lets me put the past to rest in such small fires? Who reads my mind but the pages that I jam into the coals that turn to ash and never speak again? The healthy and well spirits of place, the guardians of each direction. My crying is clipped here. I let go of what my teeth clamp. I let go of any past, any future. <clears throat> Yeah, I had a practice for a long time while I was living on a piece of land where this was possible, where I would just go have these little fires, not every day, but pretty often. And it was a huge transformational time for me to be able to kind of sit in a ceremony with myself, or sometimes I would invite other people who are staying. I was hosting a residency and I would have them come, but very small, intimate groups. And I was just so surprised at how it just never failed to like give me relief and never failed also to there was always song involved like the place really wanted me to sing um and I think that sometimes we imagine that like you have to be in some really sacred beautiful place to do something like that but now I live in Detroit now and I at my house I'm gonna build like a little fire zone in the yard so I can just do that and really what I think the, the trick is, is that no one can see you. <laughs> so if you can make it like your own little private moment, you can have your own little space. And uh, I, I think the same thing can, ha can happen with a candle. You know, you don't have to have a fire pit, but just having some connection with that kind of element, I think is really, really important. Um, okay, I'm gonna read one more from this collection. And this one's kind of heavy, but it's also, I think, something that connects to what I assume Nadia and I would like to talk about when we talk about our connection with the earth and what it is to write about the earth and think about the earth during a time when we're watching the earth die in many ways. Um, so this one's called To Watch the Earth Die. Just as true love has nothing to do with purity, I know that although I don't want to watch you die, I am. I note the daily losses, the parts of you that shrivel up, the leaving birds and frogs, the sickened fish and rivers, the weakness of your breath. I won't turn away from you while you groan under our pressure. Your witness, I sing of all that human hands have touched. I make lyrics to record our damage, where we've cut you as if you were our beard, our hair, our own to reap. I circle around you as you wither and push light into your skin, saying while weeping, I wish it weren't so. But death cannot be wished away. In this final act, your form trembles and I won't close my eyes. The last goodbye will be holy and I know it's you who will resurrect without us. That poem, came to me when I was talking to a good friend of mine about moving to Detroit from Northern California. And we were kind of talking about how, oh, am I, am I leaving and I'm gonna, you know, kind of abandon witnessing this place of beauty, these giant old growth redwoods, these like beautiful pure places fall to ruin. Am I kind of like turning away from my loved one on it on their deathbed? And I mean, I don't think the answer to that is yes, but then this poem kind of came to me where I was like, no, truly, I, will, I won't look away. Like, I might not be next to my giant tree friends there, but there's plenty of giant tree friends here to sit with and commune with and connect with. And just like, what does it look like to like commit yourself to the practice of 
you know, witnessing on all levels and how do we like maintain our connections and just but like simplifying it into the poem of saying it like that, like as if the earth is my loved one who is dying in front of me, like you wouldn't just leave your loved one to die alone, you know? And I, I that, re that actually really helped me connect to the feeling of it. And so I think sometimes like that's the poem's job is just to like take a huge, huge macro feeling or concept and that it's kind of abstract, like the earth dying, which is, you know, multi-layered and then bringing it into this like digestible human experience of losing a loved one and so that that poem I think every time I read it I'm just like yeah that's what I'm doing every day I'm just trying to find different ways to be present with that and my writing really helps me do that so someday those poems will be in a little book and you'll be able to read all of them um I, I love the line as if you were our beard right as if the earth were like the extension of the human instead of the other way around right that we are belong we're to the, the earth. Earth. <laughs> right yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so beautiful thank you for reading those new poems yeah yeah um I love all the things that people are writing in the chat too mm -hmm. um I feel this sense of like how I was saying each of those poems sort of offers um, like kind of a prompt or something and how every poem offers a prompt and like sort of like having permission uh, as just the reader to like pull prompts from other people's poems and like think of something that you see that you would want to expand on in a poem or something that specifically if it really connects to something personal for you like it makes you have a memory or it brings up something really directly from your own life you know in a lot of very famous poems there's a quote at the top from another poem and you see that that poet received this like seed of inspiration from someone else's poem and then created what they wanted to create from that so I, I just want to suggest that and like encourage that as a way to kind of find um inspiration and maybe even subject matters just things that speak to you from what you're reading and then I thought the thing I would share from my book that just came out this seasonal book is uh I I've been really in the last couple of days finally back in my garden and like able to be in the place that I love the most which is literally my face like this close to the earth being like which plant are you and I'm you know experiencing this entirely new uh garden in Detroit that I've been working on over the past two years but you know all different types of plants grow in California all year long but in Detroit they're like all waking up and I'm like who's gonna come back Who, what seeds survived and I definitely compare in this book a lot of that experience to the experience of being creative and being like, okay, you just had this whole winter to sort of germinate on a lot. Um, maybe, I mean, for me, I know personally, like I had a whole winter of very like brutal, heavy feelings. So now that I'm coming into spring, I can kind of like hold those things and figure out how I want to put them into my work. And I think the plant world is constantly guiding me in this practice of what is vital enough that will, you know, carry on as inspiration. And what do I need to maybe just lay resting for another year? And maybe it will come up next year because there's a bunch of seeds that are coming up this year that I am shocked and surprised that they lived and did what they did. And uh, so I think that that's like a good mirror for your creative process too, is just being like, okay, I maybe have been like gestating and like, you know, like there's been this long period where I'm holding all these ideas and we, we have to find these right moments and this right time in our life when they can come out onto the page and when we share them with other people. And spring is an amazing time to like make those decisions, I think, because we have like this new, energy and everything feels a little bit lifted and it can be this moment where you're like okay I feel supported in the act of figuring and making choices as opposed to like winter time where you're just kind of sitting with all of it maybe it's like heavy and sort of just on you uh so I'm gonna read these prompts from the spring section in my book that are about connecting with plants um basically 
I kind of asked this question a, a couple times in the book, like if you're feeling stuck, like what can you do? And in the spring section, I say, if you're feeling stuck, work with plants. Um, plants are my favorite guides in this time of emergence. I'm not an herbalist or a flora expert. I just love listening to the green growing earth. And spring is a very talkative time for plants. So there's so many ways to work with plants and you can kind of like invite this into your practice and whatever ways work for you. But I'll give you a couple uh, ideas. And this is on page 98 in the book, if you have it. A few considerations for connecting with plants. Has a plant ever spoken to you? What did it say? Choose a specific plant as your guide today and observe it with each one of your senses. See what it can teach you or how it aids your imagination. Every flower has so much lore attached to it. Do your research and figure out if there's a specific blossom that suits you for this period of renewal. Take a flower essence or a tincture made from this plant. Drink an herbal tea and, and you know support yourself on your creative journey. I think getting to know a plant can look like a million different ways, um, <clears throat> but it just takes like a choice. Usually that choice is kind of like similarly to what you were saying in this bird meditation where you're like, this bird just came to my mind and that's me now. This You can do this with a plant too, where you're like this, I close my eyes and the first flower I see is forsythia. And maybe I now will like look into forsythia and see if I can, I'm actually going to plant a forsythia bush in my yard this year because that plant has been calling to me and I can like learn more about it by being with it that's the quickest way to learn about a plant is just sit with it and listen to it and look at it and observe it and see what it brings up in you um and then I have other questions like can you remember the first time you realized that food grows from the earth you can write about that I love trying to remember first things in your life uh even just the task of going through your brain and trying to find a first memory of something is like an epic tomb being opened up. <laughs> so you have a lot of material there for you to, to pull from. Um, this is a favorite of mine. Watch a single tree as spring begins and note how long it takes the leaves to reveal themselves. What does this inspire in you? Can you revel in the patience and pace of the tree? I love comparing this in trees. Because some trees are just like, here's all my leaves all at once. And some are so slow. And just seeing the difference between that and remembering how we all have these different paces and there's reasons behind that. Um, is it possible for you to grow anything at your home? Even if it's just a single seed in a pot, the wonder of plant growth can add so much to the creative process. And having a plant that you're personally taking care of enriches the relationship. I, I couldn't emphasize that more um and then this I like this one I'll, I'll I'll land on this one which is just name all of the ways that you yourself are like a flower a plant or a tree this can help you connect to different aspects of your own growth and creative cycle so I think that there's just a lot of metaphor that's rich there but I also think there's a lot of embodiment that can happen and spring is the time when we're coming back into our bodies so any moment that you can kind of choose a plant to help you kind of get grounded in that feeling that will also help your creative work that's my take on that <laughs> do we want to have questions now that sounds great those are such rich rich prompts and um yeah really beautiful We can forget, right? Like we can get kind of stuck in one way of being. And then there are so many other ways of being, right? And watching that process of spring unfurling. It's like, oh yeah, things really do change. Yeah, I'd say that probably the thesis of this entire book is we forget that we're part of the earth and we forget that the cycles affect us. There's nothing really in our everyday life to remind us of that besides poetry and artistry and you know awareness practice and I think that like all of that stuff like there's a reason why I put practice in the title because it does take practice to remember like even for me a person who's 
you know, married to the planet, who's obsessed with the earth. I forget. And there's so much to have us forget, you know, it's, there's just so much in the way of our remembering. So the whole book is basically like me being, try to remember this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do we have questions? Question from Michelle. For a new writer, how do you recommend getting past that feeling of imposter syndrome and feeling like nothing you're writing is worthwhile? Who will even care that I am writing this? Thank you for asking that question. Um, do you want to respond first, Dr. Queen? Yeah, my response is, do you care? Like, because mm -hmm. that's all that really matters. I, I think that's like a huge piece of it. Like, if you care, then just that it can be just for you. And then ultimately, at some point, that can lead to something else. But I think that's like the only thing that comes to my mind with that, because so many writers throughout so all of history, everyone who's ever written anything, like, I don't think most of them started writing with this idea that like, anyone else had to tell them that they were allowed. I think that's kind of new. I think it's new because we can see each other in these like platforms and we watch like this, these concepts of success. But like you were saying before, Nadia, that like, it's like the oldest art form. And the truth is, is like, nobody gets to tell you you're a writer or not. It's you just are anybody can tap into that. You know, it does take practice and it takes care and it takes, you know, dedication. But I really think like, if you care and you care about what you're doing, then that's that's the maybe that's like a, a simplistic answer to it but that's just what came over my body I was like you yeah. you probably care yeah I almost imagine you know like um the Emily Dickinson poem like they locked me up in prose as when a little girl they put me in a closet because they like to keep me still you know like taking this child who's so just running around this little girl right and like you're a little girl you're not supposed to run around you're supposed to be still like we've done that to our creative life too right? Like, we want to move our bodies, we want to be expressive, right? That's, and then to, to think that it needs to be for someone else. So I, yeah, I encourage you all, everyone to, to allow yourself that freedom to, to move the way you want to, to move that creative energy, to open your voice, to, to move your body, all those things. I also have this feeling that it's like, to like, be really direct with that in like a practical way that I can like almost guarantee there's someone in your life who loves you and cares about you and would be like very interested to see what you're writing and a lot of times like for me I think back on my past and like before I had anything published or anything like that like I would share my work with my friends and I would Say, you know this is a poem I wrote I want to share it with you or does anyone want to hear this and just like that kind of connection of being like because I do actually think it helps if you need like a push in that in that realm to feel like you do have some kind of connection with other people in your work and there are moments you know I'm, I don't want to belittle that part of it because I think there are moments where we're like oh we've we're creating all of this like who's it for and I, that was one of my, the things in school that I think really got me as a writer and had, had me make a choice about my audience, which was basically like my professor was like, you have to decide who you're writing for. Is it just for you? Like, great. Then don't worry about editing it massively. Don't worry about anything. Just write for yourself. Is it for your friends? Is it for your like colleagues? Is it for, you know, the people who are on the level with you in your community? then just write for them, edit according to like what you think would help make it clear for them. And like, that can be really fulfilling to choose something smaller first and then kind of like keep expanding and keep expanding as opposed to being like, I want to write for the entire world before I'm really ready. And then you're kind of trying to edit for this bigger audience, but you maybe haven't like built up your craft enough. So I do think that there are these nice steps in it that can be affirming for that. I, I actually feel like I edit for myself. I just wanted to put that in, you know, then I'll share it. But I, I love, I love the editing process. Um, and so I don't always, I think of that as part of the creative process, not necessarily something for others, but for the poem itself, mm -hmm. right? Like if you have your garden, then you want it to look beautiful. Then it's like so much, or, you know, a flower collection, like then you're, you're, 
putting it together in some some structure that you're making this thing that that is beautiful for you and right so so that sometimes that distinction between writing for the self and writing for others um i agree it's wonderful to share your work but but also that the boundaries between the different kind of processes of writing sometimes aren't what we think they are anyway um I know. I feel like that question has so much in it, especially yeah. just because of like the imposter syndrome concept and like how I just want, I mean, that gets brought up a lot and I, I have eight books published and there are still some times when I'm just like, am I enough? Like, am I, is this, is this, am I worthy? Like what? But I do think that the truth is, is that that kind of idea of being an imposter in the world of poetry is like almost impossible. Like, you might want to get better your craft and like you might want to hone your skills and like be in community like this and like try to enrich what you're doing but I don't think that that makes you know you're you're not an imposter ever in the world of poetry especially if it moves you and you're paying attention we have another question here and I'm mindful of time um so how how is your time let's take this Yeah. yeah Yeah. Okay. Um, So can you speak a little bit about the place of poetry when the world is in crisis? I'm involved in environmental activism and as it can affect real change, it feels like so few people read poetry. I sometimes feel I should devote all my energy to it, but I would um, very much also like to write. So that's a great question. And I think also we wanted to both share some suggestions for other ways to get involved in earth stewardship. and I think that for, for me personally, I think each of us needs to be ourselves. Um, so if you have a desire to write and, and you cut that off because you should be doing something else, it's kind of like cutting off your, your energy flow, your, your life force, and you're not going to then be able to bring that life force to the other actions that you do. Um, but I also don't think, I think we live in a very siloed world so that everyone becomes kind of professionalized and each person only does one thing. And there are like, just even our medical system, it's like, if you have a problem in one part of your body, you go to that specialist and no one's looking at the whole picture, you know, unless you go to more alternative doctors. So I'm really interested in how can we write and do environmental activism and see our writing as a form of environmental activism and our knocking on doors to encourage people to vote as a form of environmental activism, but also as a form of poetry, as a form of communication, as a form of connection. Um, How can we are gardening and then also calling and, you know, saying we don't support Monsanto or working, you know, whatever it is, so that these different things that are so siloed normally become part of the, our whole being practice where we show up as creative beings, whatever we do. Um, so that's my response. And, and we have some, I have some resources on how to get involved in caring for the earth and reducing climate change that Katie just posted. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, in addition to writing poetry, I don't think it's an either or. I think it's all and we bring our full selves. I, what, what do you think, Jacqueline? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I would echo uh that concept that you just said for sure and especially because I think a lot of times like poems can be the invitation that asks people to join or to find the feeling that allows them to have enough energy to step forward like oftentimes a poem can encapsulate the passion that someone's looking for or needs like that reflected back to them in order to feel like comfortable enough or supported enough to then do something actionable. So I'm always interested when a poem is sort of like calling something to action, whether it be something really simple for the personal. I'm, I I think a lot of my work over the years has been rooted in, I, I, I say I do everything that I do for the earth. And so what that translates to for me is that every time I'm helping someone find a feeling or access some part of themselves that needs to be healed or engage with some thoughts of the world and remembering that the you know earth is 
part of them and they are part of the earth or all of these pieces that come along with my writing or the talks that I give or anything that that's sort of doing that work also. Um, it might seem a little bit more indirect. Um, and when I have feelings of it being indirect, which I absolutely do, then that's when I'll be like, okay, well, I need to do some like actual community hands on hands in the dirt voice with other voices. I need to listen to my community. I need to be out and with people and, you know, planting trees or at a community garden, or um, I work in a lot of schools and talking with kids and listening to their concerns about the future. And like, I just think that there's like a balance between it all, but that a lot of times the poem is just an invitation for people to, to like step into that themselves. Yeah. And and I think we need we need everyone like we need all hands and everyone, um, you know, we don't want everyone doing the same role. We need people doing different roles as well. Um, so, uh, yeah. Are there other questions? I know. I'm like, did we miss any questions? I, I'm going to go back up and look and make sure. Um, I do see one question. Uh, is poetry all about the free flow of thoughts woven into words, thoughts, and feelings? Can you please share your thoughts on mm -hmm. this? Um, I, there's that. That's kind of a big question, but I'm I, I don't I don't know if it's all about the free free flow of thoughts woven into words. Because uh, sometimes I think that I will have a giant feeling, like I was describing, and then that's when I'm trying to bring the words so I think there's a lot of feeling of all involved and then maybe thoughts are secondary <laughs> I don't know if a poem ever comes from a thought for me really yeah. and maybe but most of the time it comes from a feeling uh or I'll see something I'll actually smell something or sense something that then triggers a feeling and then maybe a memory so I guess a memory is as close to a thought as it might get that doesn't mean I don't weave in thoughts but I don't think it begins that way. So that's my answer to that. Yeah, I love that answer. Um, Lindsay, I'm interested in writing a piece like I am like a planet. I need to nourish myself with mental health. Any ideas on how to write on that? Um, I would say I'm not sure I 100% understand, but I would say maybe in response to this question and also the last question, um, that reading poetry is also a great way to, to write poetry. Um, so if you find the poems that you think are helping you do that, I love Jacqueline, the way you said poems is, you know, a place of honesty, but also of comfort, of soothing, which we so badly need in our world also, right? We're not gonna be able to address any of the crises that we find ourselves in if we can't bring ourselves back down to a place of connection and peace and listening and attention. So to find those poems that you think are working for you and then learn from them, mm. get that in your ear, the poems in your ear, in your body, and then you'll be writing from those as well. So paying attention to what's external to the poems, all the things. Um, I just want to say for those of you who are interested in Continuing, um, Katie, thank you so much. Katie, could you also maybe put a link to um, Jacqueline's, Jacqueline's um, A Year in Practice in the chat? Those were such beautiful prompts and I really highly recommend this book and also Jacqueline's other books. So, um, and then maybe also a link to I Say the Sky. Um, and thank you so much, Katie. Um, and. If you order I Say the Sky, I've put together a series of seven 15 minute meditations and recordings that go with the book. And you can um, get those either on my website or you can just send me an email with your book orders because this conversation that we're having about the dialogue between poems, learning from other poems, um, I'm offering prompts from the book. So kind of the journey of the book uh, you can go through also through your own writing. So you'll have seven, seven new pieces and then you can use them again and again and have lots more new pieces. Um, so you know, this kind of generative practice that, that poetry, poetry is. 
Thanks everyone so much for being here. Thank you all again. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you for your beautiful presence and questions. I invite you to go back to those amazing prompts that Jacqueline offered. Go back to your writing, see what it wants to develop, listen, pay attention. Um, and also give yourself permission to get involved in every way that feels right for you. I think that we can see this moment as a moment where we're like getting smaller, but it can also be an invitation to wake up and to step out and to use our voices, to use our hands, to use our bodies, to make changes individually and collectively. Yeah, I think I would end to just say it's all an experiment. So it's worth trying different pieces of it and seeing what feels right seeing what parts of, you know, community effort makes sense for you to connect with and like actually asking yourself what you have enough energy for. And as I say in my book, it, don't go too hard at the beginning of spring because you'll know, get all burnt out. So you got to take your time just like the plants do. They slowly unfurl and then they have their gift to give. So I hope, hopefully that'll be true for all of us all as well. <laughs> That's a beautiful, beautiful last, last words. Thank you so much. And you can stay connected with us, right? Follow us, reach out to us, send us messages. We want to stay connected with you and support you. Yeah. All right. Thank, Thank you, you all again. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye-bye.